today is a good day. Anytime we're in the house of the Lord, it's a good day. Uh, and we're going to be just continuing our, our faith miracle series that we started a few weeks back. Uh, this series has challenged me to trust God more. This this series has trust has has caused me to trust with all of my heart the miracles and the plan that God has for me in my life. And I pray that it is done the same for you. Pastor Isaac said last week in his message, he said, the purpose of this series is to know that there is nothing too difficult to believe when it comes to God. There is nothing too difficult to believe when it comes to God, because our God is the God of of the impossible. Our God is the God of miracles. Our God is a good God. And so we're going to continue in that series today. And in this passage of scripture, it, it, it holds dear to my heart because in 2006, this was the first message that I ever preached at Mission Ebenezer Family Church at Vacation Bible School. I was a lot younger then. I was probably standing on chairs, jumping off the stage, doing, I don't know what I was doing, but I just remember preaching about the woman with the issue of blood. And so this this message uh, is not the same message because I don't even remember what that message was. I just remember uh, preaching about the woman with the issue of blood. Long time ago. But how many of you are watching March Madness? Anybody? March Madness? No basketball? A oh, few. My goodness. So the only thing people think, I'm just Dodger season now is, you know, well, anyway, you miss you missed a good you're missing a great tournament. Uh, it is the national uh, not the national basketball, but it's the national collegiate basketball tournament where the best of the best play. It's a t three weeks. So they're getting to the sweet 16 next week. So it's a good it's a good time to, for sports. This time right here is a good time for sports. And yesterday I, I had the opportunity to watch a great game between Houston and Michigan. Houston and Michigan. I got a gentleman back there in the back who was going to a school down the road and he got on a Michigan sweatshirt, but that's okay. Coach isn't here to see that. But this game, uh, the Houston Cougars versus the Michigan Wolverines last night, uh, the Houston Cougars, they had, they were up by one point, 3.4 seconds. And I remember coach saying, call the timeout because the guy, they fouled him. He was going to go shoot free throws. And I know you guys like the last time you preached, you talked about basketball. I'm sorry. It's basketball season. That's what we do. Okay. So he's, he called, says, call timeout. And before he shot the, the free throw, they go, the whole Michigan team comes and, and you see the bench and the bench, they're like dejected. Like the game is over. It's, Three seconds left in the game. There's no hope. There's no way that we're going to come back and win this game. So the guy misses the free throw. Boom. They get the rebound. Do, 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 do. They dribble the ball up court, makes the pass. And this guy, this rookie, this freshman who hadn't made a shot all second half, takes this crazy three-point shot. He kicks his leg out the little Steph Curry look, and he throws it up there. And you see him going like this. And the ball drops, boom, and then the splash, and then the crowd goes wild, and he's running around the stadium like this, like, ah, oh, And all you guys are like, why is he telling that story? <laughs> well, here is why I'm telling the story, is because the Michigan team, they had no hope. They were dejected. They lost confidence and trust because they felt like it was over. They felt like the game was over. But this young man, freshman, unexpected, got the basketball, and when his time came, he took the shot. Now, I don't know, a lot of people, a lot of people might get that opportunity. The ball is in your hands with the last seconds of the game, and you might be paralyzed because you don't want to take the shot. You're afraid that you might miss it. You don't have the confidence 
You don't have the belief. You don't have the, the trust. You don't have the faith. That you'll make it. But this guy in his desperation. He said, I'm, I'm going to put this thing up. I'm going to take the shot. And if it goes, it goes. If it doesn't, our season is over. But I would rather be with the young man who took the shot than the guy who doesn't take the shot. See, the hard thing about and what I'm learning and what I'm seeing and noticing in, in some of us Christians, and I'm saying us as Christians, we come to church, we sit in the pews and we miss the opportunity to take the shot. We miss we miss Christ. We miss him completely because we live without power and our power comes from our faith. So some of us in here today, including myself, we have missed Christ. But then on the other side, I've seen people in this very room when it was a life or death situation and it was like, hey, man, you got this much. You got this percent chance to live. They said, you know what? I'm going to trust God over what you tell me. And so today, man, we're going to read a passage of scripture. I'm going to share a story about a woman who took the shot. Her chance came and she took the shot. And so if you can turn with me to the book of Luke. Chapter eight, and we're going to read from verses 40 through 48. When you have it, say. I got it. Y'all are fast Is everybody on the phone. So that's what it is. It's like, man, what happened to the sound of that? Like whatever happened to that? Here, I got it on audible. Y'all don't even read books on the phone. Y'all just listen to them. I know BB is guilty of that. All right, here we go. What book? Oh, chapter eight. I'm sorry. Luke chapter eight, verses 40 through 48. So now when you have it, say amen. amen. All right. Now we can begin. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him. For they were all waiting for him. And behold. There came a man named Jairus and he was a ruler of the synagogue and he fell down at Jesus's feet and begged him to come to his house for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying. But as he went, the multitude thronged him. Now, listen, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years has spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. Came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said. Who touched me. When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, now why would you ask me a question like that when there's a thousand people surrounding you know he said master the multitude strong impress you and you say who touched me but Jesus said man somebody touched me for I perceive power going out from me now when the woman saw that she was not hidden she came trembling and falling down before him she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you constantly remind us of your goodness and your love. I pray that your word will penetrate our hearts and that we will be changed and we will be different because of who you are in Jesus name. Amen. So, so Luke, man, Luke is awesome. I like Luke because what, what he's known for is giving a more detailed account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
he he he's called the physician. They call him Dr. Lou. So if you ever go to the doctor and you got a doctor that's named Lou, he's probably pretty good. But they call him a doctor and it shows in and, and, and Lou details the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, like what he did on earth through his miracles, through all of the things that he was doing. He detailed that and he was very, very like to the point interviewing people like, man, so really what happened? And so that's what he did. And he also shows that Jesus cares for all humanity. I think that's important to know because it, 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 Luke is probably a Gentile, he's not a Jew. He's probably a Gentile. So I think that's important for us to know that he is he is highlighting that Jesus is for all of humanity. And so in Luke uh, uh, chapter four, chapter four, verse 18, it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. And when he was talking about the poor, he wasn't necessarily talking about those without without wealth. He was talking about the ones that were poor in spirit. He was talking about the ones that might not, not might not be as important. And then he said. For the poor that he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captive. So he was. Bringing freedom to the low, the lowly. That's why you see Luke always talking about women. Because women there, they were low class. They had low status. And so when when we when we read Luke, you got to understand that he's 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 bringing it all together. He's giving a de- detailed account and he's letting us know that Jesus cares for all of humanity, for the poor. And he wants to bring freedom to the captives. He wants to set us free from bondage. He wants to set us free from sin. And Jesus is that instrument to do that. Jesus had just healed the demoniac and he was crossing back over the Sea of Galilee. And when he got there. It was like a like Michael Jackson had arrived. He was a pop star, as Pastor Josh said. I was looking at some videos of of uh, Michael Jackson yesterday and how the fans will faint and fall out because they just touched him like, ah, <laughs> let me touch your hair. But it was like that. and People were pressing in. They were screaming. They were happy to see that Jesus had showed up. Because they had they had heard of the good stuff that was going on, the healing. The food that he had multiplied. And so they were waiting for him. And there when he approaches, when he gets there. A synagogue ruler. Rose up on him and said, Jesus, I need you. My daughter, she's 12 years old, she's about to die. And I need you to come with me. And Jesus being a good guy, being a uh, uh, man, uh, just a good friend. He just said, all right, let's go. And then he's in this crowd. And what it said, it was like the people were around him so much that it was it was almost suffocating for Jesus. And then in verse 33, we see this lady show up and it says now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. Now, let's talk about this 12 years. That is four thousand three hundred and eighty three days. One hundred and forty four months. 624 weeks and over 105,000 hours of bleeding. I was raised in the house with three women. So I know what that is like. (laughs) I know what that is like. So she was she had that for 12 years. So when my mom and my sister had those times, y'all know what I'm talking about? I would go and lock myself in my room and then she would have to feed me under the door. Because it was crazy. I know she'll probably watch this. She'd be like, don't be saying that about me. Well, it's true. It was crazy. Stay out the way. And I got to go back through it again with my wife and then my two daughters. Oh, my Lord, please help me. 
But this was a serious situation for her. Not just because of the physical ailment, but because she was unclean. She was a person, according to the Mosaic law, she was outside of the assembly. She was she was no longer a part of what everybody was doing. She had no social interaction. If she had social media back in the day, I guess she could probably interact with people, but I don't know if they would talk to her then. Because maybe the, like the words that she was saying was unclean or something. I don't know. But she had no social interaction. She had no human touch. She was in isolation. So if she had children, she couldn't hug her kids. If she had a husband, man, she couldn't give him a hug. She couldn't cook dinner for him. She couldn't do anything for anybody because she was unclean. And so she was an outcast. She was probably weak. She was, I, yeah, I don't, I, look, I, I ain't never bled that much, but I know you're probably weak. You're frail. 12 years? You're pale. You're anemic. You can't, you, you can't stay warm. And it's just, it's just miserable. She was living a miserable life for 12 years. For 12 years, she was miserable. And then, above all of that, she was broke. I don't know what it, if any of you guys know what it feels like to live without any money or being broke. Raise my hands up two times. I know what that's like. Being miserable and broke is terrible. And so she spent everything that she had on physicians and could not be healed by any. She was at the end of herself. I don't know about anybody in this room today, but has anybody ever felt like they are they have they are at the end of themselves? Or maybe somebody in this room today is at the end of themselves like, man, I, I can't go no further. I don't know if my husband or my wife loves me anymore. I don't even know. I don't know what's going on in my house anymore. I don't know if he's going to leave tomorrow and come back in 20 days. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. How I'm going to buy shoes for my children. I don't know how I'm going to put food on the table. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen when I come inside of my church or go inside of the school because I don't know if somebody that's that that's outside of their mind going to come in and start shooting up the place. I don't know. I'm afraid. Anybody ever been at the end of themselves? Man, I don't had a man. I, I man, I don't had all the sex I could have with the with my boyfriend or my girlfriend and it's not doing and it's not fulfilling me. I know for me, man, how can I be a good father and I didn't really have a good example? I don't know about some of you, some of you dads in here like, man, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I'm at the end of myself. I'm going to just stop. I'm going to just disconnect. I'm going to isolate myself from everybody and everything in my house. Or how about, man, man, God is calling me to do something crazy, but I am afraid. I don't know. I don't. I, I feel it. I don't want to move I'm, because I'm comfortable right here where I'm at because I, I get paid. I get a check. My There's food on the table and all of that. But God is calling me out of something. I don't know, man. I don't know. Is anybody at the end of themselves? I don't know if anybody has ever been there. But how many of you guys know that when you're at the end of yourself that Jesus tends to show up? And although he's showing up, we tend to reach out. We tend to take the shot. And so there was a chance for this for this wonderful lady. Her chance had come. To take the shot. She had this laser focus because, you again, there was thousands upon thousands of people around Jesus. And so this lady, she had no energy could have been wasted. 
because she was weak. She was frail. She was pale. She she had no energy. She had no strength. But she saw Jesus pass him by. And she had this focus. She's like, my chance. I got a chance. And so she starts working herself through the crowd and she starts moving people out of the way. Man, have you ever seen like uh, remember the Michael Jordan game when he hit the double nickel? Anybody like Michael Jordan? He had the flu. Like, how many of you guys know, like when you're sick, you have you have a, a focus that is like no other. And so she was like Michael Jordan hitting the double nickel. She was like, OK, Jesus is coming here. He's like there. So if I do this right here, right now, then I'll be right there and I'll get right behind him and I'll be able to touch him. He won't even be able to see me. She didn't care. Like she was probably wrapped up. She probably had a thing over her face. And she was like, I don't care. I'm going to take the shot. I'm going to take the risk. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care. I don't care what 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 anybody thinks. I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus and I'm going to go for it. Peter didn't sink until he took his eyes off of Jesus. He didn't sink until he took his eyes off of Jesus. In Hebrews, it reminds us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so this lady here, this lady with no name said, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to take this chance. She did something ambitious. She did something risky. She put it all on the line. How many of you are willing to put it on the line for Jesus? I don't know. Some of you are are probably paralyzed by the thought that it might not happen. But then she she reached out with her with her hand. and, And as he was walking by. The image that I have is her crawling, but I don't know if she did that, but she was down low and she got down because she touched the hem of his garment. So she had to get real, real low. Some of us, we have to get real, real low to see Jesus. So she got real, real low and she was scrounging around and she just grabbed him. And she said it, it means that she she clung to him. She she made herself fixed on him. So she grabbed it. And I don't know if she let it let it go right away, but it says she grabbed it. And that's all that happened. And then the miraculous happened. It said that she was healed immediately. There was no delay immediately. Immediately. (laughs) She was healed. And then you read says. Who touched me? Who who put their hands on me like that? Augustine said that the living contact of faith is the electric conductor, which alone draws virtue out of him. So faith alone is the thing that draws power from Christ. Your faith. And God is the only thing that draws power from Christ. They said, who who touched me? Our faith has power. Your faith has power. My faith has power to move God. To cause him to turn around and look and ask, who was that? Did you know that you had that kind of power? Did you know you had the power? It said that you have if you have faith the size of a mustard, so you can say move to a mountain. Has anybody in here ever moved a mountain? Did you know that you have power? And it is given by God. It's called faith. It's called faith. Faith moves mountains. Faith heals the sick. Faith restores marriages. Faith cures addiction. Faith causes you to act. Faith causes you to act. It says faith without works is dead. 
So you can have all the faith. You can you can hear the word all you want to today and, and the next Sunday and the Sunday after that. and the Sunday. But if you don't do nothing with the faith that you have been imparted, then it's pointless. You might as well be like that individual that gets to pass with the last seconds and just holds on to the ball. I don't know about you, but when I play ball and it was three seconds left on the game in the game, I wanted the quarterback to throw me the ball. Some of y'all don't want that kind of pressure. But the truth is, the pressure ain't on me. The pressure is on God. Because I'm doing I'm being obedient to what he told me to do. He said, you got to have faith and do not doubt. And so the, the pressure is not really on me. I'm going to just be obedient. I'm going to trust God. <laughs> I'm going to trust God. And I want you to trust God as well. I mean, God doesn't care. Like. How we come. So Pastor Pastor Josh was talking about it this 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 uh, this morning. He was saying that that he, he brought out that. The synagogue leader. Jairus doesn't say that he was a, a Christian, he wasn't a, a Christ follower. He was the ruler of the synagogue. So that means that he was a Jewish man that studied the law, that he was opposed to Jesus because he was drawing people away from the synagogue. And then here is a woman with the issue of blood who, again, was an outcast, doesn't say anything about her previous faith. It doesn't even mention anything about her after that in the in the book. And so it doesn't really matter how you come as long as you come. It doesn't matter how you come as matters if you come. So you can come here. You can come into church. That's why I love church, man, because you can come in here. Fresh off the club. Liquor on your breath. You can come here. You can sit here and God will touch you. You can come in here. You can be broke and somebody will walk by you and say, man, here you go, man. The Lord just told me to give you this and he'll show up. Right on time. Man, God. Doesn't matter how you come is when you come and if you come and when you come, man, God is going to show up. He going to show up. You see, the thing is, is that like. She went to the to the best of the best, I'm assuming she went to the Mayo Clinic. You ever heard of that place? My daddy spent a lot of time there and that's the best of the best. But 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 even but even like. With modern medicine, it's cool. A lot of us are still here because of modern medicine. Some of us had surgery. Some of us, you know, we own insulin. We got all this stuff. People know exactly what's going on with you. But it's something about the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. There's something about that. And so if you believe. And you have faith, if you show up, if you take the shot, man, ain't no telling what God can do. You might miss. He might not show up. He might not answer your prayer. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. But if you don't take the shot, if you don't come, then what then what's left? So I would rather take my shot. I would rather trust Jesus. I would rather put my faith that Jesus is going to heal me, that he's going to change me, that he's going to do something different in my life. I'm going to take I'm going to take the shot.